Let's go ahead and start. Um, we're picking up with Act 1, Scene uh, scene 2, around line, take that back, not around, um, line 85, 86, line 87. <clears throat> We just concluded, or just saw, Hamlet kind of give his first speech, not a very long one, where he tells his mother that everything she has observed are, to use his terms, the trappings and the suits of woe. Trappings and suits refers to things you can put on, things you can wear, things you can show to others. The woe that Hamlet alludes to is the reality. That is what is inside. If, if you want, you could, we can even go back and use the language that we used earlier, earlier plays, talking about the difference between accidents and substance. Accidents, how something appears. Substance, the reality or the essence of the thing. Hamlet is saying, I am woe. You're merely seeing the outward expressions or manifestations of that woe. And the woe is caused, the sorrow is caused by the death of his father. So that prompts King Claudius to give this long speech. And bear in mind who Claudius is. He's Hamlet's uncle and now father, stepfather, okay? Which is why Hamlet said, little more than kin and less than kind. The king, to sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. Come on, Hamlet, you have to understand. Your father's father died and your grandfather's father died, ad infinitum. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. Filial obligation is the obligation a son has to a father, all right? To do some obsequious sorrow. You've got a gloss down there for obsequious, meaning dutiful. Um, but it's not just dutiful. It's also sorrowful. There's a, a word in the English language, obsequy. An obsequy is a statement of sorrow. Uh, there are poems called obsequies. These are celebrations of someone's death. Not celebration, yay, but remembrances, all right? So, the person who lives is bound, Claudius says, to properly mourn the dead. But, and it's a big but, to persever, persevere we would say, in obstinate condolement is a course of impious or impious stubbornness. Notice, obstinate, obstinate condolement. Condolences, you know, when you find out, talk to somebody, you find out, you know, a member of their family died. You say, my condolences, that is, my sorrows for you. I empathize, all right, or I sympathize. Obstinate condolment, notice, obstinate, stubborn, hard-headed. That is going beyond the normal boundaries of consolation. He says this kind of condolences is a course of impious or impious, as some pronounce it, stubbornness. What's it mean to be impious or impious? Against God. That's what it means. It is unpious. Pious refers to religious devotion. Okay? So this is against proper religious devotion. That's the first thing. First he says it's stubborn condolment. Then he says it's impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief. What does he mean by calling him unmanly? You're being a woman, Hamlet. 
You're acting like a woman. Right? It shows a will most incorrect to heaven. That is, you're going against God. A heart unfortified. You're weak. You're not brave. You're not courageous. A mind impatient. Impatient there means unwilling to suffer. Okay. And understanding simple, you're a damn fool. And unschooled, untaught, unlearned. And what he means by that is, look at the world around you, kid. Everybody dies. Okay. What did his mother say that caused Hamlet to go off on that little riff about clothing and such? Why seems it so particular with thee? And the it is death. Why does this death seem so particular to thee? He says, it is. Why is it particular to Hamlet? It's his father. It's not Joe Blow's on the other side of the world's father. Okay? So, in understanding simple and in school, why? For what we know must be and is as common as any most vulgar thing to sense. Why should we in our peevish opposition take it to heart? If we know everyone must die, then why should we take, Claudius is suggesting, any individual person's death to heart? You knew your father had to die. Why are you taking it so hard? Put yourself in Hamlet's shoes. And your new stepfather, formerly just your uncle, says this to you within green, to use Claudius' term, within green memory of your father's death. What does that green memory mean again? He's not been dead long. Within the course of the play, we're going to get two time frames for Hamlet Sr.'s death. Two to four months. Let's say it's two months. You're Hamlet, your father was found dead, and it's only been two months. And your uncle, now stepfather, says, suck it up. Grow up here. You're a man. Act like it. How do you take that? Partially depends upon how old you are. If you're 16 and becoming a man, that's a lot different than if you're 26 or 36 or 46, etc. Okay. Question. How old's Hamlet? There's one clue. There's one fact given in the play that tells us how old he is. We don't get it until the fifth act. Okay? It's going to blow you away. Because it sounds like up until then, Hamlet's pretty young. He's not. Not my, my terms for young, uh, or take that back, not by your terms for young. From my perspective, he's pretty young, okay? So, he says, it is a fault to heaven, that's a sin. A fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers. And who still hath cried, still, always, continuously, still hath cried from the curse, first, excuse me, course, C-O-R-S-E, all right, uh, lost my place, from the first course to, to, till he that died today, this must be so. I wrote that word course on the board the other day, and I was, it was in reference to a passage, and I don't remember what that passage is, but this was the line I was thinking of, and didn't think of it at the time. So, what does Claudius end his speech with? Be like a son to us. Why? Because he says, Hamlet, guess what? Now, 
you are next in line. We pray you throw to earth this unprevailing woe and think of us as of a father. Why? For let the world take note, you were the most immediate to our throne, meaning you're next in line. Something happens to me, Hamlet, you will be king. What's the problem with that statement from Hamlet's perspective? Remember I had written right here the other day this word, primogenitor. It means the eldest son inherits. What does the eldest son inherit? Everything. If the one who's died is a king, the eldest son becomes the king. From Hamlet's perspective, he shouldn't be the most immediate to the throne. He should be on the throne. See, the king's brother should not have become king. Hamlet should have become king. So, stay here. Don't go back to Wittenberg, the town where he's been studying at the university. Don't go back to school in Wittenberg, he says. And the queen says, come on, Hamlet, please. And he says, I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Okay? King and everybody else leaves. Beginning with line 129, Hamlet gets his first soliloquy. In fact, I think it's the first soliloquy in the play. And it's a doozy. It's it's a big one. Remember, every soliloquy, soliloquy, Q, <clears throat> reveals the speaker's heart. Every real soliloquy, we are essentially going inside the mind of that character. So the character never lies in a soliloquy in Shakespeare. The character is always revealing his or her true thoughts. All right? Now, those thoughts might be evil, but they're, they're what the, peop- the person really thinks. Hamlet. Oh, that this too, too. Come on, Dad. Sullied. Is that what this one reads? Yeah. Oh, that this tutu sullied flesh. Okay, I'm going to put that down too. Would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Now, the word sullied comes from the earlier versions of Hamlet. Hamlet's first published in 1603. I had written on the board the other day, Hamlet 1600. That's when it's first performed. It's first published in 1603. I think there is another publication date before we get to the 1623 first folio publication of Hamlet. In the first folio, the word that here is sullied is solid. Right? Look at the difference between those two words. What does sully mean? To sully something. To sully someone's reputation. Means to do what to it? To throw mud at it. To stain it. To dirty it. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh. Sullied means dirty, sinful, tainted. Would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Hmm. That's kind of hard reading. How do you get... Something being sullied, melting, thawing, resolving. Okay? The first folio reading says, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve. Now, you can understand solid, melting, thawing, and resolving. If I had stuck this in the freezer overnight, this would be a bottle of ice. And we can stand here over the next 45 minutes and watch it slowly thaw and melt. That is an easier 
way of reading the line, or that is easier to understand in what's called a branch of the discipline of English called textual editing, in what's called the lex or reading difficultist, or most difficult reading. Textual editing, when, you're, when you've got two different versions of something to compare, according to this principle, the most difficult reading, right? According to that principle, the most difficult reading is likely to be what the author intended. And a simpler reason, reading is likely to be what somebody else who didn't understand that most difficult reading changed it to. And you can look at medieval, uh, excuse me, Renaissance manuscripts, and these words look very similar because sullied isn't always spelled with two L's or with an E. Sometimes it looks like that, S-U-L-I-D. The only difference between that and that is the shape of that U. If you, were, if, I were, if you had to turn in papers for me and I have to write something on it, my O's often aren't connected at the top. You can read that as a U. So if a scribe is copying a manuscript and they see this and it doesn't make sense to them, and they see the next lines, thawing, melting, ah, something solid there. They just put solid down. Makes sense, okay? So, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. What process is that talking about? It's a chemical process. If I were to roll in a stove, put this in a pot, turn the stove on, Put a lid on that stove with a coil of tubing that came out. What would happen to that water as it boils? Turns to steam, right? What does it do when it hits that coil? It cools and condenses. And when it comes out, it's what? Pure. It's distilled. There are no impurities in it. In other words, the taintedness of the water is now gone. And what you get with the word dew is purity. Okay. Oh, that this too, too sullied, stained, sinful, rotten, foul flesh would do what? Melt, thaw, and resolve itself. That resolve is reform into its purified form. What's Hamlet talking about? Reformation. Purification. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. What is self-slaughter? That is the literal English translation of the Latin suicide. What idea has Hamlet just raised? The first two lines don't raise it. The second two lines do. Contemplating suicide. Oh, if I could just be melted, thawed, and resolved into perfection, or that God hadn't issued a law against suicide. What's the implication? God hadn't commanded against suicide, Hamlet's suggesting I kill myself. Because what's the commandment against suicide? According to Christianity generally, whatever your particular flavor or stripe, from the beginning to Shakespeare's day, suicide was thought or was claimed to be essentially an unforgivable sin for one simple reason. What can you not do 
after you commit suicide. It's literally impossible. You can't repent. You can't repent before you commit a crime or commit a sin. You can't say, God forgive me, but I'm going to go rob that bank. God forgive me, I'm going to go you know, mail for the bank. I'm going to go rape that woman. You don't get pre-forgiveness for a crime or sin. All right? <clears throat> oh, God. God. What did Hamlet say in his first little speech? Not the aside, but the other one. He has woe inside that surpasses any outward manifestation. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. If you've ever known somebody who's suicidal, or if you ever come to know somebody who is suicidal, that pretty much describes our outlook. This world is wearying, stale, flat, <laughs> that is it has nothing to attract. It is unprofitable. What's the point? Is what Hamlet is getting at. Fie on it. You, we wouldn't say fie on it. We'd say something else that starts with F. F it. F it. Tis an unweeded garden. Notice, it is a garden. But it's not a weeded garden. Because a weeded garden is beautiful and it's orderly. And it has the plants you want growing in it thriving. An unweeded garden, what happens? Why are weeds weeds? Let's put it that way. They're the things you don't want growing in that particular spot. And what do weeds tend to do? They overpower the stuff you do want in that spot. This world, he says, is an unweeded garden. That is, the weeds are overpowering everything else. That grows to seed. The weeds are the things growing to seed, not the flowers or the vegetables. And what, is that? what happens when those plants grow to seed? They sprout out their seeds, and what happens? More weeds come up. Things rank and gross in nature possess it nearly. Rank, gross. What does rank mean? Foul. Gross, enlarged, uncontrolled. All right? They possess the world. Hamlet goes on. That it should come to this. What's the this? But two months dead. Nay, not so much. Not two. Who's the two months dead? His father. So he says, it's been two months. And he says, in fact, it's not been two months. So excellent a king. That was to this. What, when Hamlet says to this, what should he do? He's alone on stage. There's nobody else there. I think what he does is he points to where Claudius left. Or he points to Claudius's seat that he was sitting in, in this room of state. That was to this Hyperion to a satyr. You've got a gloss. Who is Hyperion? God of the sun in the older regime of ancient gods. They, these are the um, Titan gods, replaced by the Olympian gods. The sun god, he's saying, my father, Hamlet Sr., was this compared to Claudius is a satyr. What's a satyr? You got another gloss, I think. I have my eyes on focus. It doesn't. Goat in man. Notice, not a man, 
not a goat, but in between the two. Like when we saw Bottom transform with the head of an ass, it made him less than human. And he uses satyr intentionally. Satyrs were known for their sexual looseness. <laughs> they would try to find women. Human, real women, not goat women, human women, to have sex with as much as possible. And satyrs also had horns on their head because the horns indicate their um, sexual promiscuousness. Okay? So loving to my mother that he might between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. He so loved my mother that he would, you know, beg the winds to stop when she went out of doors and such. Okay? Why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. That is, she, like Helena to Demetrius, doted on Hamlet Sr. And what's the problem? And yet, within a month, let me not think on it. Within a month, that implies less than a month. What? Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old, his father's, she, even a beast that wants discourse of reason, would have mourned longer. She, what? Married with my uncle, my father's brother. But no more like my father than I to Hercules. Why is he thinking of suicide? Because mom has married Uncle Claudius. Ew! And as Hamlet says, it's not even been a month. But what does he mean by that? What's he implying? The body isn't even cold. Now, literally, the body is cold. It's been buried for a while. Within a month? Ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. That is, she didn't even have time to dry the tears. He's speaking metaphorically, obviously. She married, oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. What does that mean? To post with such dexterity. I shouldn't say this. No, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> she moved quicker than lightning to get into bed with Hamlet Sr.'s brother. To be dexterous means to be very agile. Think of a gymnast. Okay. To post. That means to move. To move with such dexterity to what? Incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good. It's not good, right? Because of the second to the last word he just used, incestuous. And if the incest is at the highest level of society, Everything down below is going to be affected. Remember the great chain of being. Okay? It is not, nor it cannot. This, this is going to have ramifications, repercussions, consequences for Denmark. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Why break my heart? What do people say, what do you say maybe, to a friend, let's say, who's going through something horrible? What do counselors say to somebody who's experienced something horrendous? What do you have to do? Get it off your chest. <laughs> that literally means to get it 
out of your chest. When Harry Potter waves his wand at a Dementor and says, Expecto Patronum, what that phrase literally means is, I am seeking a guardian from outside of my chest. That is, I want it to come from in here to go out there. That protector, guardian, savior, etc. Okay? When a counselor says, you need to get it off your chest, you need to get it out. Why? What is it in here? What's it doing? eating it up. It makes the heart essentially the equivalent of the unrequited garden. Those foul, rotten thoughts, those painful memories and emotions, they become like rank weeds growing over, suffocating, killing everything else. So you gotta open it up and get it out. But he says we can't get it out. Why not? Who's he gonna talk to? Notice what Hamlet thinks is wrong. There's a problem with his mother marrying so quickly. There's a problem with his mother marrying his uncle so quickly. Okay, two, two different problems. One, she married. Two, she married his uncle. Something, mm, something's not right with this picture, okay? Horatio comes in with Marcellus and Bernardo. Okay. And they talk a little bit. Hamlet asks Horatio, why are you here? Why are you not in Wittenberg? Wittenberg. It's pronounced v Wittenberg. Okay. And Horatio says, you know, I'm a truant. He goes, no, 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 no. You're lying. Why are you really here? I, I came to see your father's funeral. I came to pay your respects. Cool. Hamlet, don't mock me. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Notice the implication. Well, you could do both at the same time. The implication is, as Horatio says, indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Remember in um, Minister's Black Veil? Funeral, wedding, followed hard upon that very same evening. Hamlet, thrift, thrift, Horatio. What does he mean? Kill two birds with one stone. You know, what do you often have at funerals? You have a meal for the family that survives. Or a wake. Hey, why not use the same opportunity, the same place settings, the same food to also celebrate the wedding? Hamlet is suggesting was in the minds of his now father and mother. Hamlet said, methinks I see my father. Horatio, where my lord? And when I think when Horatio says, where my lord? He does this. He looks around. Why? Because he, just the previous evening, saw Hamlet Sr. In my mind's eye. Horatio, yeah, I saw him once. He's a goodly king. And that's when Horatio says, I thought I saw him last night. Uh, who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father. Calm down. Because when he says the king, your father, that can mean what? Now. Claudius. Season your admiration. That is, hold on. Let a little time pass, just, just, we'll explain. And let these gentlemen, you know, be witness to this. So, Horatio explains what he has seen and what Bernardo and Marcellus have seen two other times before him. Hamlet asked, did you speak to it? He said, I did, but it didn't do anything. I mean, it lifted its head up acted like it would speak, rooster crowed, etc. Tis very strange, says Hamlet, which is the exact same thing that Horatio said. Okay? So Horatio says, we thought we should tell you about it. Hamlet, and it was armed, top to foot. Okay? 
You didn't see his face? No, yeah, I did. The beaver was up. That is, the face guard was up on the helmet. How do you look? You know, he didn't look angry. He looked sorrowful. Pale or red? A little pale. Fix his eyes upon you? Most constantly. Whew, wish I'd been there. Horatio, it would have amazed and what amazed means is not just surprise. It means frozen in your tracks, Hamlet. It would have stopped you dead. Not literally dead, but deer in the headlights, the phrase we use. Okay? He goes on, talks about it again. Hamlet says, I'm watch keeping watch with you tonight. 242 or so. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it. Notice, if it assume, what does that assume mean? It means take the form of. If whatever this thing is appears again as my father, I'll speak to it. <coughs> Though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. In other words, come hell or high water. Hamlet's saying, I don't care if it's the devil. I am going to speak to it. Don't tell anyone what you've seen. Okay? So they all agree. Everybody leaves. Hamlet gets a little brief soliloquy. My father's spirit and arms, all is not well. Notice, he doesn't say something. He says all. The whole world, Hamlet's perspective, is screwed up. I doubt, meaning I expect, some foul play. Oh, would the night would come. Like Theseus, man, he wants the night to move quickly. Till then, sit still my soul. Okay, so if he has to tell his soul to sit still, then what is his soul doing? It's starting to bubble up. Remember he said... Peace, break my heart. In other words, because he can't let out what is troubling him, he's saying it's going to break my heart. Here, the soul is starting to bubble up. And he's like, down boy. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. That is an idea that goes back to the earlier Middle Ages that, to use the phrase Chaucer uses, Murder will out. That is, a murder will be revealed. It will somehow reveal itself. Often the case is the murderer will somehow reveal himself. Okay? Scene three. We're in Polonius' house. Okay? Polonius is the advisor, the chief advisor to the king. And we see it first. Laertes, Polonius' son, and Ophelia, Polonius' daughter. Laertes is older than Ophelia. Laertes has been off at university. Okay, he's about the same age as Hamlet. He's been off at university in Paris. And he's talking to his little sister before he gets ready to leave again. He says, I've got everything ready. That's my necessities are embarked. That is, my bags are packed. The implication is, like, they're on, on the horse or on the whatever. And he says, um, so what's up with you? He asks her about Hamlet in the trifling of his favor. Hold in a fashion and a toy in blood, a violent and youthful primy nature. Forward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting. The perfume, perfume and suppliant of a minute, no more. And what's he saying? He knows something's going on between she and Hamlet. But he says about Hamlet's intentions, hold them no more than a trifle. What's a trifle? Some little stupid, unimportant thing. He's saying Hamlet doesn't really love you. And that's why she says, no more, no more, but so don't, don't think he's serious. 
So Laertes goes on, and he does what? He explains how boys think to his sister, who doesn't know how boys think. Think it no more, for nature crescent, that is nature growing, does not grow alone and fuse in bulk, but as this temple waxes, the inward service, that is the body, as the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. So he's talking about as a boy grows into a man, etc., his mind gets larger, not physically larger, but looks at things differently and starts to think about bigger issues. A 14-year-old's concerns are not the same as a 24-year-old's. Because a 14-year-old doesn't have many responsibilities. A 24-year-old has a lot more responsibilities. A 14-year-old doesn't have to plan out his life. A 24-year-old does. So he goes on and says, maybe perhaps he loves you now. And now no soil nor copper doth besmirch the virtue of his will. Maybe Hamlet does love you. Okay? Throw that out. But his will is not his own. What does that mean, his will? His volition to act, his ability to choose for himself. Why isn't it his own? Because Hamlet is the prince. He's the future king. What has to be thought of? The kingship, the throne, the future of the state. Big difference between when Prince William got married to Kate Middleton and when his father got married to Princess Diana back in 1981 or 83. Charles didn't get to choose the love of his life back in the early 80s. Because if he had, it would have been now Queen Camilla. He was seeing her all the way back then. I think at that point, she might have still been married. Right? She was divorced fairly soon after he married Princess Diana. Okay? <clears throat> Why? Why couldn't he marry her? Camilla back then. Let's say she was divorced at that point because she was a divorcee and the king of England cannot, or future king, prince, by law could not marry a divorcee. That's why King Edward IV in the 1930s abdicated. He gave up the throne because he was involved with an American widower. Wallace Simpson was her name. He wanted to marry her. The whole family said, you can't do that. <laughs> the law doesn't even allow it. So he gave up the throne. And his little brother, George, became George VI. That is Queen Elizabeth's father. So there's this tension you know, in the family, so to speak. All right? So he says, maybe he loves you now. But his will isn't his own. He can't choose you. Why not? Unlike Kate Middleton, excuse me, unlike Diana, Diana was determined to be of partly royal blood. The Spencer family line goes back. Kate Middleton doesn't have a lick of royal blood in her. She's just a commoner. Middle class, family's wealthy, but commoner. Ophelia is a commoner. Her father is the advisor to the king. Okay? So he goes on and says, Hamlet, Hamlet will have to obey those who give him advice and such. That's why the king, by the way, thanked all those advisors for going along with the plan for him to marry shows how there's something rotten in Denmark, okay? So, he goes on and says, um, when what loss your honor, line 29, 
What honor, what loss your honor may sustain, if with too credent ear you list, that is listened to, his songs, or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear what you will lose, meaning her virginity. If you lose your virginity to Hamlet, he's not going to marry you, he said. And bear in mind, Shakespeare's day, as well as the time frame in which the play is set, which is at least 100 years or so earlier, a woman's virginity was her, what, uh, bargaining chip. If, if, for example, you know, the bands were being read in the church for a couple to get married, and we, we talked about it before the band, and somebody stood up on one of those Sundays and said, John shouldn't marry Shirley because I've slept with her before. That is cause, that was legal cause for the impending marriage to be totally annulled, for the betrothal to be thrown out the door, all right? It wasn't for a woman to say, John shouldn't marry because I slept with him. Double standard, right? Because the double standard was very much in play then. It more or less still is there. So, he says, don't have anything to do with Hamlet. He wants only one thing. All he wants is to get in your pants, okay? Which is what her father is really going to say, much more than Laertes does. Laertes at least, at least admits the possibility that Hamlet is true, faithful, loyal in his love for Ophelia. Okay? She says, I will, I will the effect of this good lesson keep. I get your point, I will remember it. And then what does she do? She takes the, she refers to the phrase I used just a moment ago. But do not, as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of gallant stread. Okay, dear brother, I will take your advice. I won't sleep with Hamlet, but don't you go back off to Paris and start sleeping around with every woman you see. In other words, don't tell me the way to paradise is a thorny, rocky road while you think you're gonna you know, sleep on rose petals and such. She's throwing the double standard back into his face. He goes, oh no, no, don't worry about me, okay? Polonius comes in. Polonius says, what are you doing here? Here, and he gives him his blessing, and that probably means Polonius literally does a cross over him this is a Christian society. We're going to be told again and again. And he says, in these few precepts, in thy memory look thou character. Character doesn't mean, he doesn't say, be aware, pay attention to your character. He's saying, in your mind, characterize these. Character means right. So, store this stuff in your mind. And we get a bit of advice from Polonius to Laertes. An awful lot of people read, uh, from, yeah, Polonius to Laertes. A lot, awful lot of people read Polonius' advice to Laertes as bad advice. I think they're entirely wrong. We're gonna talk about what he says. So, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Give thy thoughts no tongue means what? Don't speak what's on your mind. Nor give any unproportioned thought his act. What does that mean, unproportioned? How do you proportion thought? You put it within boundaries. An unproportioned thought is being what? Thoughtless. Reckless. It's not caring. So don't just respond. What is one of, at least, Oedipus's faults, failings, failures? He's rash. He's impulsive. There's a guy on a wagon blocking his way. He doesn't move out of the way and let him, no, he's going to stand there. And, OK? 
Okay, what else? Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Be thou familiar. Let people see you, be around, but don't overstay your welcome. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. You will undoubtedly sometime in your life. You have a party. You say it's going to go from, I don't know, 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock or 6 o'clock to midnight. And there's always one or two people who just don't get the hint. It's time to go. And they stick around two and three hours later. You go and you put your pajamas on, you turn the lights out, and they're still there. That's what he's getting at. What else? Friends you have, and their adoption tried, that is, and you've proven their friendship, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. That is, tie them to you, metaphorically speaking. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatch unfledged comrade. In other words, let's update that to the 21st century. Don't assume your friends on social media are your friends. Or put it this way. Don't assume that someone you just met is going to have your back. Okay? Of each, uh, excuse me, of entrance to a quarrel, beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Don't get into a fight or argument, but if you do, what? Win. And not just, you know, 51 to 49 win. Win in such a manner that that person knows never to challenge you again. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. That is, listen to what other people say to you, but don't be free with your own advice. Take each man's censure. See, that's a little different than just listening to them. To take each man's censure means let them criticize you. But reserve thy judgment. Oh, yeah? What about? Don't do that. Bear the criticism and don't respond. Costly thy habit, your clothing, as your purse can buy, as you can afford, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, meaning well-made, but not Elton John-ish. <laughs> not gaudy and flashy and, I think I've used this image before. What would you think of right now if somebody walked, one of the students who was there, walked in one of the guys, and he's wearing a tux. You go, not right. Not the right situation. Or a woman came in wearing a wedding gown. That would be gaudy, okay? Neither a borrower nor a lender be. Why? For loan oft loses both itself and friend. You loan 20 bucks to a friend and the friend doesn't pay it back. That kind of puts a kibosh on the friendship. And loan, excuse me, and borrowing dulleth the edge of husbandry. Husbandry means hard work, industriousness. This above all, that is above everything else I've just told you, to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. What does that mean, to thine own self be true? It has at least a couple of meanings. Don't do something you know to be wrong, first of all. That, take that back. Second of all, first of all, follow your moral compass. If your moral compass says, do this, do that. <laughs> it says, say this, then say it. Because once you're untrue to yourself, what? You can't be true to anybody else. Okay? Gives his blessing, Laertes leaves. Polonius asks, what were you and Laertes talking about? She says, oh, you know, the Lord Hamlet. Okay? And she explains to him, 
He hath my Lord, line 99, of late made many tenders. And I know it's time to go. We'll pick up there. We did not get nearly as far as we needed to. Um, we'll pick up there on Friday. All right. Have a good day.